rockets. Whether it's the commercialization of space or the colonization of Mars, rockets are bound to be a key component of the future of the human race. In this video, I will be teaching you about the fluid dynamics behind the De Laval nozzle. So let's get right into it. Let's start by talking about what is a De Laval nozzle. The De Laval rocket nozzle is the most commonly used nozzle in rocketry, and it's the same one you see in most of SpaceX's and NASA's rocket launches. All it is is a simple tube with a pinch in the middle. This pinch is called the throat while the part on the left is called the converging section, and the part on the right is called the diverging section. The goal of the nozzle is to convert high pressure gases in the converging section into low pressure, high velocity gases in the diverging section. Rockets work using Newton's third law, which states that for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. So this basically means that the faster the gas particles are moving out of the nozzle, the more thrust the rocket will produce. So in order to optimize the nozzle, we will want to maximize the mass flow rate, and this idea can be used can be explained using a mathematical proof. So we'll start with the mass flow rate equation, where m dot equals the mass flow rate, and mass flow is a measure of air output in terms of volume per unit of time. And I don't want you to get this confused with gas velocity, because unlike gas velocity, mass flow rate does not change because of the conservation of mass. And so R is the gas density, V is gas velocity, and A is the cross-sectional flow area. And if you can imagine taking the cross-section of a cylinder, it would be a circle. And a De Laval nozzle is essentially a cylinder, so the cross-sections would be circular. So in order to maximize mass flow rate, we're going to want to take the derivative, and we can use chain rule to get derivative of mass flow rate with respect to time equals the partial of mass flow rate with respect to gas density times derivative of gas density over um, change in time plus the partial of mass flow rate with respect to velocity times the derivative of veloc velocity with respect to time plus the partial of mass flow rate with respect to cross-sectional flow area times the derivative of cross-sectional flow area with respect to time. So we can evaluate these partial derivatives and we get the following equation. So this equation can be simplified by multiplying dt to both sides. Oh, and remember, the derivative of mass flow rate is zero because mass flow rate is constant due to the conservation of mass. Um, so we get the following equation and this can be simplified to zero equals change in gas density over gas density plus change in gas velocity over gas velocity plus change in cross-sectional flow area over cross-sectional flow area. Now I want you to remember this equation because we'll come back to it later. Okay, so we're going to temporarily switch over and talk about the isentropic flow equation. And one thing to note while we're talking about this equation is that we're assuming all gases are ideal gases, and this will make a lot of our calculations and proofs a lot easier. So the isentropic flow equation is change in density over density equals gamma times the change in gas density over gas density. So gamma is the ratio of specific heats and is also known as the isentropic expansion factor. So the ratio of the specific heats of the gas is at constant pressure and constant volume. Um, I wouldn't worry too much about that as we're gonna substitute out of the equation pretty quickly. Um, so we can rewrite this equation by multiplying P to both sides. And then we can use the equation of state, which is density over gas density equals R, which we all know from AP Chem to be the, the universal gas constant, which is 8.31 joules per mole Kelvin. Um, times the temperature. So we get, um, sorry, we get change in density equals gamma times the universal gas constant times temperature times change in gas density. Then we can use the speed of sound equation, and we know the speed of sound is a constant, which is 343 meters per second, and the speed of sound squared equals gamma times r times t. So we get change in density equals speed of sound squared times change of gas density. Now using the conservation of momentum equation, we can substitute um, this R times V times dV in for dP, and we get um, gas density times velocity times change in velocity equals the negative of 343 meters per second squared times change in gas density. And we can rewrite this and isolate the gas densities on one side which will help us. Follow me over to this side. Um, we can substitute 
the equation for Mach number, which is Mach number equals velocity over speed of sound. So if, if something has a Mach number of one, that means that the velocity is at the speed of sound. So we get negative Mach number squared times change in velocity over velocity times change in gas density over uh, gas density. And then we can use the previous equation from the previous slide and we can substitute this value of dr in and we get negative Mach number squared times change in velocity over velocity plus change in velocity over velocity times change in cross-sectional area over cross-sectional area equals zero. Now we can rewrite this equation and get our final equation. One minus Mach number squared times change in velocity over velocity equals negative uh, change in cross-sectional area over area. So this equation is interesting because it tells us how velocity of the gas changes as the cross-sectional area changes. However, these, these values are also dependent on the Mach number. So for example, if the Mach flow is subsonic, which means m will be less than one, and this term will be greater than zero. So we have the equation negative dA over A equals dB over B. So this means as the gas moves down the divergent end of the nozzle, the, the rate of change of the cross-sectional area will be positive because the divergent end slowly gets bigger. So this means that dV over V will be negative and thus the exit velocity of the mass will slow down as it's moving out of the divergent, divergent section. So on the contrary, when the flow is supersonic, m is greater than, greater than one, and this term will be less than zero. So then we'll have a negative on both sides and that'll cancel out. So we'll just have dV over V equals dA over A. So this means as the gases are moving down the nozzle, the cross-sectional area will increase and thus the cross-sectional area, uh, sorry, the, the velocity of the gas will increase. So this just means as the gases are moving down the divergent section, they will speed up. Another interesting thing to note here is if we take the limit as Mach number goes to one, this term will become infinitesimally small, right? So if we divide this term by both sides, we get dA over A times something infinitesimally small. So if we take the limit as Mach number goes to one, we would get dV over V goes to infinity. So that's why the theoretically most efficient nozzle has a mass flow rate of Mach 1. If you are interested in this topic and would like to learn more, please check out my paper for an in-depth analysis.